Great, you can stop the music. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good evening everyone. I know it's always tough to be in the presentation, the last one before the beer, so. So anyways, uh, my name is Ashed Galor. Uh, I'm uh, working for uh, Huawei, in European Research Ar uh, Center, and I will be talking about the hybrid cloud. Um, let's start. So with a show of hands, uh, anyone here attended the multi-site uh, session two hours ago? Okay. <laughs> So I will do some review on parts of it that are uh, crucial for this one. So what is a hybrid cloud? So in the 15 years of evolution of data center, we've seen we moving the data center from bare metal data centers to virtualized data centers, then to private cloud and VPCs. Uh, then we started doing cloud burst using extending our private database, da data center, sorry, into uh, public cloud. And uh, in recently, we're talking about hybrid clouds, which is essentially connecting together public clouds and private clouds in some way and to gain additional resources. Today, we're talking about hybrid cloud. Hyper cloud is a hybrid cloud over clouds, and I'll explain about that. So, how does it look like? Basically, you have some top management, OpenStack API, where the users are working, the tenants are working, and on the bottom, you have multiple public clouds, maybe private clouds as well, and you have some resources that are residing in a specific cloud. Some resources will extend across different clouds. What can you do? So, first of all, it's a single pane of glass, which is you know what the customers want. You have one resource management. You have uh, monitoring and dashboard from one place. You have user and role management in one place image repository, which is always a headache, and you have network topology. Uh, you don't need to take photos. I have uh, it on SlideShare. I will send you, I'll give you the link at the end. So, cross-site networking, which is the holy grail, extending the L2 and L3 network across, across different clouds, uh, allowing you to have the same subnet, and the same IP range in different clouds which is very important if you want to uh, move VMs, migrate VMs across uh, different uh, clouds without doing reconfiguration of everything. Quality of service, you can do rate limitation based on the tenants when you're crossing the WAN. Um, heterogeneous cross-cloud overlay, that's very important because you, ha you may have different vendors, different clouds, different overlay types um, on each public cloud, maybe even each private cloud, it's very important to cross between them. Security alignment. You want to have cross-cloud cross network access control list. You have to use the same security groups. Otherwise, when you're moving your VM from one place to another, start, things will stop working. Distributed firewall service. Geoelasticity, which, uh, as my colleague said earlier, is a fancy name for uh, redundancy. Uh, you want to have a geo load balancing. You want to have the resources that you need for load balancing in the, r in the right place. I mean, if you have traffic coming in suddenly from North America, you want to have your resources in North America, not in uh, APAC. Uh, you want to optimize uh, automatically the service for the best user experience while keeping the OPEX lowest because the cloud business is about OPEX. You want uh, to maintain regulatory conformance if you cannot move resources out of your country and, you know, you know this... Uh, issues, uh, quality of service and SLA constraints, if your service needs to have specific SLA or specific latency restrictions, you want it to run in, the, in the, the right place. Zero configuration. So when you're moving a VM today, you're moving the VM and then you need to move its image, you need to move it, all its volumes, all its networks, all its configuration, everything. That's, that's a headache. So we're talking about moving the VM along with all its ancillary configuration, the security groups, IP, address, volumes, images, firewall entries, and everything. Um, load balancing pools. You can define load balancing by the subnet, meaning you create a subnet, and every machine that, log uh, that acquires an address in this subnet, no matter on which cloud it resides, automatically becomes part of the load balancing pool without doing configuration manually every time. Images, so images is, uh, is a tough problem. 
You want to have images automatically synchronized. You want, when you're moving a VM from one cloud to another, you want the image to already be there and to be the right image in the right version. And you want to have automatic format conversion. You don't want to deal with it manually. So, maybe a wrist one? No, it's okay. So what, what can we use it for? That's important. So I have a few use cases, nothing fancy. Um, Cross-cloud application deployment. Uh, you have an application, you want to deploy the database on your private site, you want to deploy the web front end uh, instances on, on other sites, you want to, to deploy the application back end in a different site, so it's possible with that. Cross-cloud application migration. So you want to move an application from your private side to the public side or the other way around from a public side back to the private. Uh, cloud, cross-cloud app application scaling or cloud burst as we know. Uh, you have an application running on a certain load, now you want to scale it out. So you want to scale it out to different clouds without doing all the configuration required. Add clouds dynamically, you want to extend your hypercloud while it's running so you can add more sites, even public, public sites as well as private sites. And of course, you may want to take out a site. For example, you want to move from AWS to Azure, for example, because of price or something like that. Cross-cloud uh, disaster recovery. So some kind of calamity destroys one of your private sites and you want to move the workload to your disaster recovery public, public, cloud, public sites. Cross-cloud containers. So containers are becoming more and more uh, handy these days. And one of the problems with containers is, first, they, they don't work with VMs, the same network, it's a problem. Uh, and the second is you certainly cannot deploy one container in this cloud, the other in a different cloud, and still have them communicate. So something like this, okay? Parts of your application deployed in different containers and in different sites, and they, get, they can still communicate with, with each other. So about containers, we're gonna have a session uh, about Courier, the new project. Gal, my colleague, is going to talk about it uh, tomorrow. So I recommend going. Uh, so what is the challenge making this work? So this is Tower of Babylon. Uh, it was an amazing project while everyone, everyone was talking the same language, okay? But then when people started talking different languages, it, it, it didn't work. So connecting public clouds is basically the same. They have different APIs and that's by design. They have different features also by design because that's that's a differenti differentiating uh, value. So cross-cloud activities, that's, that's very complicated to do with just API conversion. It's a headache, as you can see, this guy upstairs trying to make several building, it doesn't work. The answer, cross-cloud consistency. You need an over-cloud management in order to maintain this or manage this consistency. Otherwise, it, it just won't work. So, why am I talking about this in OpenStack meeting? So, it's because we're going to make everyone OpenStack, and that's why we will be able to use OpenStack to do it. So, what are the building blocks we're going to use? First of all, we're going to use OpenStack. That's a big surprise. Um, we're going to use the uh, tricycle multi-site management uh, which was presented two hours ago. I will touch about this because most of you did not see that. And the last building block is a data protection as a service, which is a new project uh, that we are uh, also launching. Uh, and another colleague of mine will be talking about this on Thursday. I, I, will, I will give you the link soon. Okay, so how to make it work with all those public clouds is by using jackets. I will explain about that. Of course, this is the, if you want to see the DPaaS, sorry, Data Protection Service, it's a nice acronym. Just make sure to attend this one. I will give another uh, picture of it at the end. So let's talk about TriCircle a bit in a nutshell. So TriCircle, you see the picture is very similar to the one I showed in bef in, in before, but the bottom sides are all OpenStack. So TriCircle is part of the OpenStack. It's an actually, it's a project OpenStack has uh, even a production uh, environment right now. Um, 
which is essentially giving you one open stack to manage one top open stack to manage multiple bottom open stacks. Okay, so how does it work? So this is actually the, the experimental branch. It's not the, the, the one that is currently in production. I don't go over it, but this one. So basically, uh, you have a top side, you see, as you can see, and multiple bottom sides. And the open si on the top side, you have an unmodified OpenStack management layer. That's basically the APIs of OpenStack without any modifications. And then you have an OpenStack adapter, which basically um, hooks and takes all those API calls and handles them uh, within the uh, all the rest of these green uh, green boxes. You see, okay. So I don't want to go too deeply into it, but eventually uh, you have uh, all your uh, activities like launching a VM and everything that precedes it. Uh, being handled and distributed through the cascading service of the top service. You see the cascading service and cascaded service, you have two services. And eventually it is uh, being performed down on the bottom side. Okay, so this layer provides you the consistency of doing everything that is related to, m to uh, lifecycle management of your OpenStack resource done as a transaction. Okay. Tricycle uh, cross-site L2 connectivity. So Tricycle um, talks about extending, stretching your L2 uh, network across the OpenStack instances. We need that for the hi hybrid cloud, hybrid cloud. Uh, so this is how it is supposed to be to be done. Uh, currently, the proposition is to use a, something we call a broader, broader gateway. It can be anything. It can be hardware. It can be software. We are working on doing it in the reference implementation using the uh, some, ex some extensions to the Neutron L2 gateway. So this is something that we are currently uh, in discussions with the L2 gateway team. Uh, so you have multiple compute nodes on one side and you have multiple compute nodes on the other side and what you do is you have this border gateway basically keep being capable to uh, mapping your uh, tenant uh, tunnels on one side, the tenants, tenant tunnels on the side, on the other side, and moving the da data between them. Okay, so it's basically done uh, through uh, either L2 population on both sides or flooding. It's it's open for uh, implementation. Okay, and then you can you can see that you have the same uh, subnet on both sides. So, a bit about hypercloud now. So the hypercloud architecture. As you can see, it, you have the hypercloud management on the top. It's on uh, one side, which is basically the, um, the OpenStack, uh, the tricycle OpenStack management layer. On the bottom side, you see on the left side or your right side, you see an OpenStack instance. This is basically like tricycle is doing. It's the same. And the other one are uh, public clouds. I, I've picked uh, AWS and Azure. Of course, it can be, I don't know, everyone. Um, the idea is that whatever is running inside the OpenStack as bare metal or you know, under the hood core services needs to run inside VMs on the public cloud. You don't have access to their core. So everything runs as a VM. So we have VMs that are actual workload VMs and we have a VM that is running our jacket, okay, which is this, this part of the system that makes AWS, a VPC on AWS look like, like it's a OpenStack resource. Hypertenant, this is very important. So this is the abstraction we use. When you are creating a VPC on, let's say, AWS, it's easy. So you have a tenant in AWS. You create multiple VPCs, up to five, if I remember correctly. And um, you can define the CIDR, the network, uh, the network um, um, IP range for each VPC, and from that point on, Amazon will manage those IP for you. You cannot do a static assignment. On the, so I I've put here two tenants on AWS, uh, uh, two VPCs on one of them, one VPC on the other, and I have uh, another tenant on OpenStack, just a regular tenant on OpenStack. And what I want to do is to define this uh, new entity called HyperTenant, which is basically a tenant that runs across is like an overlay on top of multiple uh, provider tenants, okay? What does it mean? How do we do that? So we manage it 
a tricycle manages basically uh, on a single keystone right now all the users. So all the all the bottom OpenStack instances will connect to the top keystone where all the tenants are managed. Of course, in this case, we have a, a public clouds where we don't have access to the tenant management. We have a different tenant than the one we are actually talking about. So we have our jackets talk to the keystone on the top or a federated keystone in the future and basically do uh, all the local activities uh, for that hyper top tenant, hyper tenant, uh, do it with the local uh, provider tenant from Amazon uh, locally, just on behalf. Okay. Well, now I have to say the same thing I just said, so I feel redundant here. But okay. Hyper network. So a hyper network is this overlay on top of different clouds. In this case, we have on the left side this flaming Amazon uh, re de de decomposition of all its entities down to the VM. So you have a region, you have a tenant, you have a VPC, you have a subnet, you have VMs. Okay? The VMs are given, as I said, are located IP addresses by Amazon. You cannot change it. You just decide the, your network range and that's it. On the other side, we have the open stack tenant and network which you create and a subnet which you decide whatever you want. We want to have the hyper subnet basically uh, putting all those VMs on the same uh, subnet. Okay, in this case, it's the same like the one in OpenStack because in OpenStack we can do whatever we want. In Amazon, it's, it's more challenging. So this is uh, the same hyper subnet. <coughs> so how do we do that in Amazon or in other public clouds, which is the big question here? We reuse OpenStack for management. So I know this slide is a bit complicated, but it gets worse. So bear with me. <laughs> so on the right side, you have the OpenStack. You have four hosts here, four physical machines, two running a compute node, Nova compute node, and one running the network node, one running the controller node. It's typical OpenStack. Uh, on the other side, you have four virtual machines running strange animals we call hyper node, hyper control, and a hyper switch. So let's take off the hood and look inside the engine. So what is inside? So I know it's complicated, but actually not. So most of it looks this kind of, I don't know, gray, this, this color, I don't know how you call it. It's all OpenStack, it's just OpenStack. It's an OpenStack uh, compute, OpenStack controller, OpenStack network. You, see, you can see it's the same on the all, both sides. In this example, I've put Dragonflow, which if you are not familiar is, um, it's a Neutron implementation using SDN, SDN controller. It's a very nice project. I recommend you to look into it. It's very good. Um, but it's, of course, not mandatory. You can just use, you can see also you have the Q agent, the Neutron agent, which basically the, different, the default implementation of uh, Neutron. Um, so basically, it's the same. We didn't change anything. We deployed the compute node, the network node, and the, uh, and the controller node inside VMs on the public cloud. And we did a, a, a small addition to the Nova driver, okay, which I will show soon. We've added a, an additional bridge in the OVS. I'll show it. So another complicated slide. Here we can see the Amazon on one side. We can see the OpenStack on the other side. And we can see the cascading service from the top, from the price that we mentioned before, managing both of them. So uh, what you see is each VM in Amazon basically has two IP addresses now. It has one IP address got from Amazon. This is the PIP, the provider IP. Okay? And it also has a hyper IP address, which is the IP that we actually want to use. It's, the, it's it within the same subnet as OpenStack. Right? And we have a router, the Amazon, the Amazon router, uh, which makes sure that Everything uh, being sent goes through our hyper node, our compute node uh, proxy. From there, it goes through the hyper switch to the other side, 
through the border gateway, same as tricycle, it's the same. And the control, the hypercontroller, basically makes sure that we can, you know, do the lifecycle management locally. Do all the uh, creation of VMs, creation of uh, resources, tying everything together. This is the, the control part, okay? And it feeds directly from cascading service and uses the keystone on the top. And of course, there is also the, the Nova driver there that is uh, responsible for creating additional hypernodes as we, as we go along and need them to you know, create more subnets, create more hypernodes. So, end-to-end -end flow. Another complicated slide. So, we have um, this orange, big orange box there is Amazon. I've actually, um, the, or the right side, it doesn't matter if it's another public cloud or it's an open stack. It's once it gets out, it doesn't really matter what, what is the other side. The other side could be the same, it could be just native open stack. It's, it doesn't really matter. So how we did that was, uh, first, we've edited the, the, the routing table. Uh, we did some custom route table, which is an op Amazon uh, uh, capability. Uh, we've placed our hypernode, which gets an IP address from Amazon. We've placed it as the default gateway for the custom route table. Okay, you can see. It's the default gateway for everything that is supposed to go on the hyper subnet. Okay, so we make sure that if the VM, VM1 in this case, tries to ping VM2 on the, you know, the hyper IP address, it will reach the hyper node. The hyper node will do the translation from this IP, okay, to something that is routable to the other side. Okay, so you can see the red box is an additional bridge that we've put into the uh, hyper node in which is based on the compute node, uh, the novel compute node of uh, OpenStack. This bridge does the, the does the address translation. We did that with uh, by adding a, um, this is a bridge, the OVS bridge. So we added a few uh, OpenFlow uh, rules there, which uh, do all this uh, trick. Okay, it's uh, we're going to release this in open. So this is going to be an open source project, so we're going to release it soon. So everything. I say here you will be able to uh, to look into the code. You also see the L2 pop, so that's optional. You can do pre-population of L2, uh, teaching both sides the MAC addresses of the other side, and um, you can just do it with flooding. It, it depends on whatever implementation you choose to uh, deploy. Um, in order to make the hypernode, the VM that actually hosts the hypernode, able to get this or inject itself into the, uh, the the data path, because you know no one's sending his uh, packets to this to this VM. They're sending basically to the other one. So you just do um, source detection check disabled in Amazon, and then it will allow you to get past those uh, um, uh, security checks that Amazon uh, puts on all the VMs. I'm not going to talk about hyperimage and hypervolume in this uh, session uh, because it will, there will be not enough time for it. Um, I, I do have a couple of screenshots, and I, I see I actually I finished uh, much earlier than I planned. So, um, how does it look right now? So, the user uh, experience basically is is not really changed from from what you what you're used to. You just get another uh, drop down when you're launching an instance to data center. Okay, so here we see uh, an AWS in Tokyo, we see a vCloud in Beijing and so on. It's actually, yeah, nice. Um, we, it's actually taken from a working proof concept that we have in Huawei. Then afterwards you can see you have, you know, all your instances and you see basically uh, what Tricycle does, it's mapping an availability zone to each site. So. Uh, what you see here is each uh, public cloud has a is assigned availability zone, and that's how you uh, use the, uh, the existing OpenStack abstraction to uh, to manage all of it. Um, this is basically it for me, uh, because you know uh, people want their beer cold. So 
if you uh, uh, want to check out these two sessions tomorrow, and yeah, I, I'll yeah, give time for explanations. Right on. And uh, if you want to grab this on SlideShare, then this is your link, and now I'm open for questions. Yes. If your Amazon controller stops. Okay, so basically uh, we had the same questions in the tricycle uh, uh, session where it wasn't an Amazon controller, it was just a slide or something. So it's basically the, it's a policy that you need to decide whether you want, if, if one site is, you know, goes off the map, you want it to stop working completely or you want it to continue working. Everything that still works, works. Just the control, you cannot manage the, your running instances. You cannot uh, stop them, you cannot create new ones on that side by Everything that is deployed works because, you know, the controller is not on the data path, okay? You don't need it to run in order to have stuff that is already deployed working. Three? HA for the controller. That's a good question. He's my boss, by the way, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah. HA for the controller is also possible. More questions? Yes. Good question. So, it's a good question. It's actually two questions. I will repeat it if, if you didn't hear. So, the question was you have two VMs, that, and correct me if I'm wrong, you have two VMs in Amazon, okay, and you don't want to go through the hypernode if these VMs want to talk to each other or else you do want them to only be able to talk to each other using their hyper IP addresses. Okay, so first of all, uh, let me emphasize something I missed saying before. The hypernode that I showed uh, is just one, u one uh, of multiple solutions that are possible in order to make this work. Uh, it's basically, it's an agentless solution when you put the hypernode as a, as, as a node, as an actual node you need to go through. There are other alternatives we've explored, for example, doing the hypernode functionality running inside the VM as an agent, which is, it's good for performance, but yeah, customers don't like it because it's introducing a, a, some kind of software piece that runs inside the VMs. It's also possible to do it in other ways, like for example, using a container that runs this VM, or sorry, a container that runs inside this VM, um, and other nested hyper uh, and uh, virtualization. There, there are other solutions to do it as well, and then it's easier to to do this cross, uh, you know, VM to VM on the, on, the, on the same side without going to the hypernode. In this use case, you need to go through it. So, in order to make sure that your VMs cannot talk to each other using private IP addresses, they the provider IP addresses, it's a security um, um, rule that you put. You just block it, but. In real life, if someone will actually deploy this kind of uh, system, uh, I'm not sure that they will be aware of those um, provider IP addresses because basically they moved an application from one place to another. The application keeps on running. Nobody is actually logging <laughs> into the VM and uh, looking at the IP addresses. They just expect it to work. So, so I understand the question, but I'm not sure if uh, if I answered it. Uh, uh, any more? Any more questions? Yes, Neil. What is the status of the thing? Does it work? Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, this is actually um, this is actually something that we are currently uh, working for production. So we are doing it in open source, but we are also uh, basing uh, the commercial product on it. We have several um, several uh, uh, customers that we are uh, currently in late st late stage of uh, proof of concepting and prototyping and so on. Um, we also use it in the Huawei uh, public cloud, uh, HWS, uh, to some extent, of course. 
uh, Huawei itself has a compelling use case for this kind of uh, uh, solution. Uh, they run their own um, um, uh, e-commerce site, Vmall, where, where they uh, sell their uh, uh, mobile devices. So when they have a big sale, there are some several dates where the traffic is too large, so they cannot meet this uh, traffic surge on their public cloud, so they um, spin up VMs in a Alibaba uh, cloud. So they basically need this for themselves and for other also for other customers. Uh, question, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, so I repeat the question. So you're asking about, let me try to rephrase it. Um, migrating the application, not just the VM, right? So I mentioned it in a use case, this is what we want. We want to migrate it, uh, an application and not a VM because you need to migrate it with all its ancillary configuration, the security group and the IP address and the firewall uh, configuration, everything and attached volume image. So because we are moving it with the IP address and making sure everything is basically working the same way, Putting aside the fact that you may have now uh, traffic going on the on the one that you didn't want, but putting that aside for a minute, this is basically solves most of your problems because now the VM has the same IP that just runs in a different place, same L2. It still it can still work with the same data. It doesn't even know that it moved. It just may have uh, you know uh, degradation of performance. So, but. What we are uh, doing in 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 this uh, is part of this uh, the tricycle actually, and uh, also the data protection, which is a different project, is handling the uh, protection of the application itself. I don't want to touch in no on it because there is a different presentation for it that uh, Elan, my colleague, is going to give uh, on Thursday about data protection, uh, which is going to touch on all these. Uh, and ancillary and the, the ability to uh, protect the application, not just the VM. Right? Any more questions? Beer, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>